Guys, Merry Christmas, everyone. And you say, Merry Christmas, Pastor D. All right. Hey, isn't God good? Aren't you glad to be alive? Man, I feel good this morning. And I, I, I love, I, I, how many of you guys are familiar with uh, Bethel Church in Redding, California, and the incredible Pastor Bill, Pastor Bill Johnson? He always says in, in, in his way that he does, God is good. And he's in a good mood. <laughs> Look at the person next to you and say, God is good. And he's in a good mood this morning. Do you believe that? Then let's clap some hands. Let's clap some happy hands this morning. Good. If you got your Bibles, uh, turn with me. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 2. We're in a, uh, in a Christmas series that we're calling Jesus is King. And um, today we're going to be talking about um, uh, uh, the shepherd king. We're going to be looking at, um, uh, at the story of the Magi, um, the wise men, and how they came in. And, and they, were, uh, they were searching. They were seeking. They were, they were very in tune with a shift that had taken place in the, in the spirit realm. And, um, and so this is this pretty, a pretty wild journey that these things go on. And um, how many know that in our, in our city, in Seattle, um, that there are spiritual seekers and, uh, and a lot of them are more in tune with the spirit realm than even a lot of people in the church. And how many know that seekers will be finders and finders will be sought after? This is the story of, of some fascinating mystical, scholarly, famous, magi or wise men and their journey, this, this adventure that they've been on for quite a long time to, to, to meet a king. And my prayer is that this Christmas season, all y'all SRCers would be reminded that Jesus is not just a Galilean peasant that was born in a barn that we read about from Genesis, I'm sorry, that we read about in the, the Gospels, between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus is not just this, the, like this, like guy that has been portrayed, uh, like this, kind of this 1960s John Lennon in Birkenstocks with like great hair that just goes from city to city saying, yay, consider whatever you do, what, what do I do with my hands? Like consider the flowers of the... And, and peace, and you know, that when we read, <laughs> I mean, no sense, I, when we read about Jesus, <laughs> that the story of Jesus doesn't begin in Matthew 1. The story of Jesus doesn't begin in, 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 in Mark 1. The story of Jesus doesn't even begin in Luke chapter 1. That the story of, of Jesus uh, is, fills and floods every page of our, of our Bibles. Yeah, from Genesis 1 all the way to the very end of Revelation, and that the Bible uh, contains this incredible testimony and record that Jesus is, Jesus was, and Jesus forever will be our victorious King. All right, let's read. Matthew chapter 2. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men came from Jerusalem. And, uh, and they came saying, where is he who is born king of the Jews? This is fascinating here. Um, we see that the wise men come into Jerusalem and they get an audience with the king. They get an audience with King Herod. Um, and we know that this is a big deal uh, because um, we read that, that all of Jerusalem is about to marvel at the revelation that comes from this conversation. Now, uh, we call these guys, and by, by the way, we don't know really that, that there were three of them. You know, we've got this song. We're three kings of glory. And everybody, we're three kings. Like, okay, so first of all, we don't actually know that there were three of them. Um, that's kind of the more the nativity story. We based off of the fact that there were three different kinds of gifts that were offered: the frankincense, the gold, and the myrrh. Um, but what we do know is that there is 
this procession that, that captures the attention of Jerusalem as these Persian magi come into town. They are granted an audience before the king. So they come and they meet before King Herod that was known as King Herod the Great. And the first mistake that they made is the very first question. Um, so they ask King Herod the Great, who believes that he's like the greatest king ever, right? Like, like he, he probably had a t-shirt that was like, I'm the greatest, who wants to touch me, right? Like Herod was really quite full of himself. And so here we've got, which I find this funny, here you've got the wise men, and the very first thing they do is they make what my wife would call an unwise choice. <laughs> like here you've got this guy that's full of himself, that's really high on his own kingly authority, and they come and they say, Hey, uh, like, so why are you guys here? Are you here to see me? I see you have gold and frankincense and myrrh. And those just so happen to be my favorite presents, right? So here the, the magi come and they're before the king. And what do they ask? Hey, so we're actually kind of looking for a different king. We're looking for the king of the Jews. How offensive would that be? Why? Because Herod, he believes that he is the king of the Jews. Yeah. And so we see here, they continue. The wise men say, for we saw his star when it rose. This is amazing. We see in Psalm 19 that David declares that the heavens declare and testify of the glory of God. So here you have these mystical magi. Here you got this word for almost magician. These, uh, uh, these very wealthy scholars. I'll just be honest. There's a lot of mystery around these celebrities that come into, that come into town. Um, so I can't not even for a second really get my head around who these guys were. But these guys are a pretty big deal. Like we're here to, we're here to find um, this new born baby king who happens to be the new king of the Jews. For we saw his star. We were in tune. Now, where is this star at right now? It's right over top of where they're meeting. So here you have Jerusalem, and here you have a king, and they don't even know about the star. They're not even aware of this revealing in the heavens that is declaring, it's time. He's here. Isn't it interesting that you've got these Persians that are aware of the messianic prophecies? It's also kind of interesting because we know that King Herod um, was uh, very intimately aware with the Messianic prophecies. That King Herod himself, you could say, was sort of a half-Jew. Uh, he wasn't Jewish by blood, uh, but he was Jewish um, almost by association in that his, his, um, his ancestors before them were uh, sort of converted into Judaism uh, against their will. And so he was very familiar with the, with the Jewish faith, and yet Herod's kingly loyalty was to Rome. He was in cahoots with the Roman government. Now, here's these magi, these very wealthy, influential people. They've got their gifts. They say, we're here to meet the king, and we know that he's near because we have seen his star. And you know what Herod was thinking. What? He's, he's got a star? You, 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 know, you know Herod was thinking like, I want a star. Right? Like, like, like what's up, brother? God's the dude to get a star around here. Right? Like, he gets a star. I want a star. Somebody gets me a star. You're all dead. I kill you all until I get me a star. Right? And they said, <laughs> we've seen his star and we have come. To worship him. You know Herod be trigon. Like he trigon out like. <laughs> he's just like. His, he, he trigon and twitching. Like King Herod. His eyes are just. Like he is just. He's wigging out. And the, <laughs> and the wise men. Come on. Are they really that wise? 
right? Like, we've come, we've come to worship your replacement. <laughs> Don't worry, he's just a vulnerable baby, you know. He's got his own star, and when we find him, we're going to worship him and not you. We're, how really, like, how wise were they, really, right? It says, when we find him, we want to worship him. Worship, meaning we want to <laughs> be uh, prostrate. Good. That word makes me nervous. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll just share you at the first service. The word worship means to go prostrate. That's just what it means when you look it up in strong, okay? But the word makes me super nervous because I'm always afraid that I'm going to say prostate. And so, just so you can all relax, worship has nothing to do with your prostate. And, and, I, and thank God, <laughs> thank God I didn't say that. So, <laughs> so anyways, I'm glad we just got that out there. And that way I don't have to, you see, what I do is we just talk about stuff and then we don't have to be afraid of it. Isn't that good? I'm, I'm just modeling to you how, you know, what a real Christian looks like. Okay, so anyways. This word, this word worship means to go prostrate. Good. It means to, 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 to go horizontal. It means to, to, to fall on your face. It, it, it means to kiss. And they say that we are here to discover this one that we know Israel's been waiting for. We are here um, to meet him and to worship him and to give our offerings to him. And again, um, this, is, this is scandalous to the narrative. Why? Because, guys, these are very um, non-Jews. Like, when you've got your little nativity and you've got the little shepherds that come in the Meshiva, and, and then all of a sudden you've got the new agers that showed up. Like, that's like, like, this is like what's going on. Like, like you got the shepherds, you got the sheep, you got the, you got the, the angel over the barn. It's, it's so, you know. And if, and if, you, give, if, if you gave, you know, 500 bucks to TBN, you know, 10 years ago, your manger saying glows because you got that for free. But, you know, so you got this nativity kind of scene. But if you think about it for a second, imagine that we're all Christians, we all love Jesus. All of a sudden there's a knock at the door. And all of a sudden there's Oprah and Deepak Chopra. And they've got a bunch of crystals. And they've got their, they've got like, and you're like, who invited them? Christianity is, it, like the Bible, is so wonderfully offensive, but we just, we render it over time to be tame and, and palatable. But when you actually read the Bible, you're like, what? They get to be involved? The magicians? Like, yeah, Oprah, Deepak Chopra, and um, David Copperfield. Like, here's a dove. <laughs> and, of course, the drummer boy. I forgot my gift, but I pump, pump, pump. All right, let's just keep, <laughs> let's keep reading. We're going to make it. When Herod the king, okay, so check it out. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So guys, this is out. This is not a private thing. Um, uh, Herod is like, he is, okay, in the Hebrew it would be um, T-O'd, okay. And I can show you the symbols for that. Um, he was deeply troubled and all of Jerusalem was with him. So what did he do? He, he gathered his chief priests. He gathered his scribes. You know, chief priests, scribes, oracles, uh, magicians, come. And, and they got their scrolls. Figure out what's going on. He inquired of them, where is this Christ going to be born? And, and they, check it out, their scribes discovered that he was going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea, where it was written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, am by no means least among the rulers of Judah. So this is what um, Herod's scribes are saying. He will be born in Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, uh, Judah and by no means 
least among the rulers of Judah. And from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is what they say. He'll be born in Bethlehem um, and he will be the shepherd king. Now, guys, we've been, we've been talking recently that if you want to see who Jesus really is, that we've got to dive into all of the scriptures, all of the stories. So a few weeks ago, we talked about Joshua and Jericho. We looked at how Joshua was a type uh, for Jesus, that Jesus, um, uh, that Joshua's name even means Yeshua, which is Jesus. We, we learned about um, uh, Job, that, that Job uh, is pointing to Jesus, the true and perfect innocent sufferer who would go through suffering on behalf of us and achieve incredible victory that we get to become participators and heirs uh, as our own and inherit. Last week, um, uh, we talked about Jonah and the dragon of chaos. And uh, listen, if you weren't here last week, if you didn't get to dive into that little rabbit hole, that there was a good time. Okay? Uh, so you can go online and watch that for $13. And... But this week, we're going to look at Jesus, our shepherd king. At Jesus, this one who came um, unrecognizable. This one that came underneath the radar of Herod. This one that came underneath, uh, he, he wasn't born in a, in a palace. He was born uh, in, in a barn, in a, in a manger. And, and there's these radical um, sim similarities. David, remember David and Goliath? Remember King David? Um, uh, he was a king, and Jesus was also called and is, Revelation 19, we talked about this last week, the king of kings. That Jesus, as revealed in the book of Revelation, has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand, and he will return on a white horse to judge nations. It says, and written on his robe and tatted on his thigh, says, king of kings. David, a shepherd boy. Christ revealed as the shepherd, Psalm 23, and then fulfilled in John 10. David was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was likewise born in Bethlehem. When David, when, when Absalom rebelled against David and went up to the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went into exile, on the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas, where did he go? On the same mount, the Mount of Olives, his soul was deeply grieved to the point of death. And being in agony, he began to pray fervently with loud cries. It said of Jesus from the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that Jesus would be a mighty man of valor and a warrior. In 1 Samuel 16, it says of David the same exact words. A mighty man of valor, a warrior. It said of Jesus... Uh, they conquered the devil. This is Colossians 2.15. He conquered the devil, triumphing over him through the cross. Just in case you didn't hear that, Jesus conquered, past tense, the devil and triumphed over him through the cross. Somebody asked me about Leviathan and the power that Leviathan has today. I'll answer that. Leviathan has been conquered. Jesus has triumphed over him through the cross. And since we're doing Q&A, I see that hand. Uh, no, I'm just having fun. I know, I know. Love you. Um, what about Jezebel? Yeah, so uh, Jezzy has been conquered by Jesus Christ, and Jesus triumphs over her through the cross. And this was modeled prophetically through a prophetic drama when David... The shepherd boy went before Goliath and conquered him. It is said of Jesus that he is the anointed one and the Messiah. It was also said of David that he was the anointed one of God, the God of Jacob. David, he was the son of Jesse. What did they say of Jesus? He was the son of David. I had somebody say to me recently, you should come to Israel. I said, I'd love to do that someday. I said, people come to Israel and they come to different lands. You engage with the land where your expectation is centered on what has happened there historically. When you come, if you can come with us, 
we want to invite you to the city of David. And we want you to experience this city through David's eyes. <laughs> they said of Jesus that he was merciful to his en enemies. They said of David the same word choice in 2 Samuel 16 that David was merciful to his enemies. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was riding on a donkey and they hailed him, king as, uh, they hailed him as king, shouting, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. For David, God swore to him with an oath that he would, that he would seat one of, his, one of his descendants after him on his throne and to establish his kingdom. Whew. Do you think David had any idea? Through your lineage will come Christ, the victorious king. For Jesus, he holds the key of David. Revelation 3, verse 7. It was said of David, the Lord spoke through Isaiah the prophet about the one whose shoulder he would seat the key of his house. Jesus was persecuted by his enemies. David was persecuted by his enemies. Jesus has been exalted at the right hand of God as both Lord and Christ. David prophesied of the Lord, telling the Lord to sit at his right hand. If you want to get a picture of Jesus as victorious king, you can read the stories of David and see the justice, the might, the cries, the prayers, the songs. And we get a glimpse into just a small portion, a small little fragment of who Jesus, our king, is. Jesus is the true and perfect David. Jesus is our victorious king. What camera's on? You? If you're watching online, Jesus is our victorious king. Not that he was. This is not an eschatological, big word, victory. We are not waiting for, you might be waiting for the victory of Donald Trump. I can tell you this. Regardless of what happens there, and I say what happens, because I'm not all too convinced that it's over. But that's just me. Let's not get political. We're at church. <laughs> Regardless of what happens there, Jesus is our victorious king. And I have his victorious royal blood flowing through my veins. Listen now. I am not limited by my own genetic um, bloodline. I am not limited by any sort of iniquitous or any sort of infirmities within my own genetic bloodline. Why? I got new blood. I've got victorious blood. And this blood states and dictates, it is written within my scroll that I am accountable to steward the victory of Christ. And he's, he's yelling. Why does he have to yell? I am accountable to steward the victories of Christ Jesus. To steward them, to manifest them, and to multiply them. Which means that I am accountable to settle for nothing less than God's very best. Not just in my life, but in your life. Why? It's not enough just to contend for justice within me and my family. That it is my role and commitment to partner with the Holy Spirit. That any sort of injustice or infirmity or iniquity that I see within my life or within the family here at SRC, that I am committed to execute justice. I am committed to be a dispenser of mercy. I am committed to be an ambassador of reconciliation. And that means that when I see all hell coming against you, that I'm going to get in the trench with you. That our elders and our pastors are going to get in the trench with you. Why? Because victory must be the testimony and storyline for you and your family because that's what he bled for because that's what he died for now listen that does not mean that we're going to go through that we're not going to go through hardships it doesn't mean that we're not going to go through seasons but when we do 
we will go through it together with a resolve that we will stink and get through it and we will not build a little holy ghetto in the midst of suffering and that we will not make the wilderness our home. Why? Because Jesus is our victorious king. He is the pattern. He is the blueprint. He is the invitation that the Bible is not here just to tease us. It's here to invite us into our freedom. That we would experience an encounter. Hey, I said that we would experience, that you would experience and encounter the freedom of Christ Jesus. And that you would be a freedom fighter. <laughs> A freedom fighter, a dispenser of righteousness, an executor of the justice of God. But there's more verses. <laughs> I just want <wanted, laughs> I just want to hover and preach for a while, but there's more verses and you got to roast in the oven. Verse seven. Then Herod summoned. The wise men secretly and ascertained from them uh, what time, this is interesting, he wanted to ask the wise men what time the star had appeared. Why? If he could figure out the timing of the star, he could plot out the trajectory of the star and find out where the baby is and kill him. And he said to them, go, go to Bethlehem, search diligently for this child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I too can come. And worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen when it rose went from them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Can I tell you something? When you meet Jesus, you know what you'll find? The joy of the Lord that produces strength. That the good news of the gospel is that when you meet Jesus, he's not going to stand there and slap you in the face and judge you as some sort of disgraced child. That when you find Jesus, you'll find your own prodigal moment where Jesus runs to you and embraces you in his arms and picks you up and with great pride declares over you, this is my child in whom I am well pleased. It says that these wise Persian magi met their creator, and they rejoice. Verse 11, going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Now, I want, you to, I want you to think about this for a second. Um, these magi, they came into a palace, into Herod's palace, okay, and they stood before an a earthly king who called himself great. And there in the presence of Herod, they had a conversation with this king. Okay. Palace, king, gold, royalty, all this. And the magi have a conversation. Now, look at what happens. The magi step into a barn. They see a baby. And there in the midst of the glory of God, all strength leaves their legs. And they fall to the earth in worship. They had found the shepherd king, the one that had been prophesied, the one that had been declared for generations he's coming. And they had seen him with their eyes. And then it says that they opened their treasures, you know, once they, once they composed themselves. You know, what does this look like? You know, we've got this cute look of, uh, of the manger scene. But for any of you that have ever encountered Jesus and had one of those moments where strength left your legs and you found yourself on the floor, you'll, you'll know that there can be tears and there can be laughter. I remember being 13 years old and wanting an encounter with the Lord so badly. And I remember being at Word of His Grace Church and my dad was ministering and, and I was so hungry. I was just a teenager, maybe younger, maybe 12. I, I, don't, I don't know. And I remember going to the prayer line and there was this minister and his name was Greg Daly. And he came up to me and, and he laid hands on me. And I, rem I, and, and I don't really remember what happened next because when I came to, I was on the ground and I felt the presence of the Lord rippling throughout my entire body. And at that moment, I thought of my, of my friends who were no longer really my friends because their parents were saying that my dad was full of demons 
kids. And, and I, I remember just sitting there laying on the ground thinking what they had said about my dad, that this was the devil and that this was demonic. And there laying on the ground, that thought hit me. It's so funny. And I began to giggle at the thought that this joy and this glory and that this wonder could somehow be caused or created by the devil. And me being 12 years old just began to giggle. And then the giggling began to turn into laughter. And I, I could not help myself. And I began to hold my belly and just began to roll to the left and to my right, just laughing uncontrollably with the joy of the Lord. And then it occurred to me that this laughter wasn't just me. This was the joy of the Lord. And all of a sudden, um, the presence of God began to dwell up even more with a, with a greater glory and a greater intensity. And it began to turn into tears. And I began to weep in the joy. It wasn't a sad crying. It wasn't a mourning. It was, it was that place of such wonder and such pleasure that I just began to weep and weep and weep. And then the tears turned back into laughter. as I And I began to go back and forth laughing and crying crying and laughing and crying and I remember as they put me in the back seat of the car I remember going to bed that night as the presence of the Lord just continued to minister to me as I laid in my bed as a child laughing and weeping and enjoying the presence of the Lord we see here the magi are in the glory of the Lord and it says that the strength left their legs and they are on the ground worshiping we don't know how many hours this was but I can imagine there was tears and laughter and this place of being overcome and undone by the glory of God that was in a barn that was in a stinky barn with cows and, 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 and whatever happened there and there was Mary this servant of the Lord that said yes to the Lord embracing the reproach of being accused of being unfaithful being un accused of being uh, uh, of one that's engaged with someone outside of wedlock the virgin that is given birth to the Christ man and there is Joseph the man who heard from God and pledged his allegiance to Mary who said that he would give of his life and his loyalty and his leadership to make sure that Mary was safe and that this baby Jesus was safe and there in the glory of God are these magi these Persian outsiders and God includes them he includes the pagan and he receives them and celebrates them as sons that they got to be a part of the most holy moment that the earth had ever seen up until that moment and there they were they were included in the family of God demonstrating that the kingdom of God is not just for the Jewish people but that the kingdom of God is for all nations that for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior which is Christ the Lord and this shall be a sign to you you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And it says that when they had composed themselves, when they had put themselves back together, then they responded by giving of their treasures to the shepherd king. They offered him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh Fulfilling the prophetic word of Isaiah 60, verse 6, that the wealth of nations would come to God's people through the Christ. Verse 12, it says, after being warned in a dream, the wise men decided to make the very first wise choice and not return back to Herod. They departed to their own country by another way. Declare this with me. Jesus is my victorious king. You know, Satan doesn't care if you believe in Jesus. James 2.19 says that even the demons believe in God and shudder. There's a battle for our belief. We see in 2 Corinthians 4.4, that the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which do not believe. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ Jesus, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. In this time, there is a battle for our belief. 
in this present time, there is a battle for who is Jesus going to be in your life? Is Jesus just going to be your savior? The one that you needed to forgive you of your sins so that you could somehow manage to make it into heaven? Will Jesus simply be just your savior or will he be the Lord of your entire life? Will Jesus simply be your rabbi, your savior, or will he be your victorious king? Listen, this is not something that I pulled out of the old can for y'all. I swear I did not preach this sermon last year. Last year we needed something from God's breath and heart for last year's season. I can tell you this, we are not in last year's season. I can tell you this, it ain't 2019 anymore. In Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Last year was great, but behold, God is doing a new thing. And the question I have for you, are you going to engage with what God is doing in the present? Or are you going to try to manufacture what God did in the past? Living off of last year's revelation or living off of the revelation that that you got back in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. Listen, if you're nibbling on that bread, that ain't bread anymore. That's a rock. How many of you have ever nibbled on an old loaf of bread? (laughs) Looking like a chipmunk with a pine pine, (laughs) trying to get some sort of virtue or life out of it. Drop the rock. Drop the old breath. God is doing a new thing. And he wants to demonstrate his victory, his life, his light, and his freedom in every area within your life. I'm going to tell you this. The curse is broken. Jesus is victorious. And people are getting set free. And I'm not talking about last year, 2016. That was great. God bless it. I'm talking about in, even in the last seven days. Well, I'm talking about um, a, a, a person practicing witchcraft on our property. Coming on our property twice a day. Twice a day. One of our intercessors declared, um, I see her staff. Because she had a staff, a seven foot tall staff that she would carry on the property. And the intercessor said, I see the staff broken. On the day we went to confront her in love and in grace to plead with her um, to discover what Jesus had in store for her. On the day we went to plead with her, on that day when she came onto the property, somehow her staff somehow just broke. And we went to meet with her and her staff was broken in two as I began to read her mail and began to tell her what her, um, what her religion, what her false religion, what this deception had cost her. As I began to read her mail, and begin to plead with her, telling, can't you see what these entities, what this energy has cost you? This is true, isn't it? And she nodded her head and she said it was true. With her broken staff, she drew a line in the dirt. And I said, that is prophetic, that you just drew a line in the dirt because God is inviting you to cross the line. She said, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was inside your church. And I took off my clothes and I left my clothes inside the church. I said, that dream was from Jesus. He's inviting you into the family of God to take off your old clothes, to take off your old mantle, and to receive garments of salvation, white garments of righteousness. I said, today is your day to cross the line, to believe in your heart, and to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And she said, I can't do it, and I won't do it. I said, then, as one in authority, I have to tell you, you are not allowed here on this property any longer because we have a very specific intent for this property and for this house and you are confronting you are an enemy of what we are have been called by God to do that there was the that that thing that got exposed and we we pleaded but I can tell you this the power of that thing was broken well we have not she was all over Newcastle and all over even our our neighborhood and, and I see her here and there I haven't seen her since that 
that day. We commissioned by, by invitation from the Lord, by directive from the Lord, to commission an angel at the entrance of our property. So Anthony and I went, and there at our entrance of our property, we commissioned, like Eden, an, uh, an angel was assigned to, to as, a, as a guard, as a, as a post with a burning sword to keep, uh, to, to, to protect that, 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 that place. And we commissioned this angel. And, and then as, as we were done, we were celebrating. We walked up into the parking lot. And a bald eagle is flying right for the building, right for our church. And it, it almost hits the church. And it banks up. And, it, and then it begins to do circles over top of, An of Anthony and I. And we pull out our phones. And we begin to record. We begin to record this bald eagle as it's flying in, uh, uh, over. And we prayed at the entrance, every curse broken in the name of Jesus. We, we had um, uh, just this last week, my children and I were in our tree fort that we, had, that we had built. And it's got a door on it. And it's got a lock on it. And I had this conversation with Chris Carbonell at our Christmas party about, you know, I should get the carpet out of the fort because we got leaks in there. And the carpet is getting wet. And that wet carpet could cause rot in the floor. And so I took my kids out there this last week. And we unlocked the door. And, and we went to remove the carpet. And when we did, somebody had broken into our tree fort. And they had, they had painted pentagrams and upside down crosses underneath the carpet and then, and then covered it back up with the carpet. Pulled up this thing, this curse that had been there for a long time. We had been in that fort since this, this, since this thing had happened, had been exposed. We broke the curse. We commanded the curse to be broken. We took the spray paint. I covered up their signs and symbols, painted Jesus is Lord. And I can tell you, it's almost been every day for the last week that we have had opportunities to come into agreement with the fire of God and we have seen demons take a knee before the foot of the cross. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. He is our victorious King. Infirmity, sickness and disease will take, a, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ, in Seattle, poverty will take a knee before the foot of cross. In our region, the opioid epidemic is going to take a knee at the foot of the cross. Why? Because of the kingly authority in the bride of Christ, in the church, in the body, that sits in her throne and demonstrates and declares the curse is broken. Sexual perversion, confusion is going to take a knee at the foot of the cross. That those things that have cost your family line great joy, that those things that took out your dad before it was his time, those things that took out your mom before it was her time, that fear that what happened to your dad is going to happen to you, that what happened to your mom is going to happen to you, it, it, it may be but the blood. Maybe that could have been a reality. The problem is, is that Christ Jesus summoned you to this service today. Not to hear from Darren. No, please. You don't need to hear from Darren. You need to hear from the Holy Spirit. And that means that the power of Christ Jesus, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, is here to set you free in every area of your mind, your will, and your emotions, in every area of your physical body, and every area of your spirit. Listen, there are people here and you dragged in demons that have been with you for a long time and they were on your mommy and your daddy and your daddy's daddy and this, that and the other and you think that this is just the way that life was meant to be. That is not why he died. He did not die so that you could stay in Egypt and eat porridge. No, he died so that you could get your butt out of Egypt so that you'd be a free man. You'd be a free woman. That you'd be able to step into the land of promise. The land of destiny. But you got to be willing to get out of Egypt. You got to be willing to say, yeah, the porridge, <laughs> it's okay, but I'm willing to enter into the adventure where I have to put my trust in this king of glory. Yes, there will be adversity. And yes, there will be your Red Sea moment. And yes, there will be that moment where, like, what am I going to eat? Yes, there will be these incredible opportunities. These are opportunities to, far to partner with your father. Opportunities to partner with your God. Because I can tell you this, maybe you might know a lot about him, but you're about to know him for yourself. You're about to have those Moses moments where God has to show up. Otherwise, Houston, we have ourselves 
a problem. Listen, I'm inviting you this morning into a new reality. It's not religion. This is a demonstration, an encounter with your King of glory, with your Creator King, with this Shepherd King. You're being invited to step into the chaos. You're being invited to step into the madness. But before you do that, you first have to address the chaos and the madness inside of you. And you have to be willing to see that God himself is drawing a line in the dirt. And he's saying, who will you serve? And our response together this morning is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve Jesus, our victorious King. I believe that the atmosphere and frequency of heaven is vibrating through the floor that your feet are resting on right now. I believe that you are surrounded by an innumerable uh, a, a company of angels. I believe that even above your head that the great cloud of witnesses are interceding for your total and complete victory. I got good news. You're surrounded in the spirit. You're surrounded in the natural. And whether it happens today or it happens this time next year or it happens 10 years or 20 years, this is why. I declare your victory is inevitable. You will be set free. You're a son of victory. You're a son of freedom. But I pray that you don't delay your victory. I pray that today you say, this is my day. This is my moment. This is my family's moment. This is our time. Religion is not an option. We're not going to go another five years playing the religious card. We're not going to, we're not going to just try to say, what does a good little American Christian look like? And try to reverse engineer that. We're going to say, no, Christ, my victorious King, the frequency of heaven, that frequency of victory is residing within me. And I'm going to steward it until it's blowing up inside of me. Until this King of glory is coming out of my eyes. It's coming out of my mouth. It's coming out of my hands. It's coming out of my atmosphere that everywhere I go, atmospheres will shift and principalities and powers will take a knee take a knee take a knee take a knee chaos take a knee madness take a knee sorrow take a knee injustice take a knee poverty take a knee you will bow bow now you have permission because you're a son of inheritance to speak to the principality and to command it to bow now. Bow now. Take a knee at the foot of Jesus. Today we're going to um, respond in a similar way that the, uh, that the Magi responded. We're going to receive tithes and offerings we're going to give this morning. And then when we're done giving, we're going to sing. We're going to pour out our hearts be, before this, this shepherd king. And at the very end, I'm going to have our pastors and elders come. And we're going, to, we're going to take this oil as commanded in the scriptures that the elders would anoint those with oil. And the sickness, disease, and oppression would leave people's bodies. That today is a day not just of declaration. Today is a day of a manifestation of this victory and this king of glory. If you could put up the instructions for how to give uh, with tithes and offerings, that would be great. Um, you can give with credit card, debit card, cash, all that. Oh, that would be great. We've got it there somewhere. Um, as you're preparing your gift, if you look in your um, uh, bulletins or your little thing that you got, you'll see a red envelope. With the Red Envelope Project, we are only $1,700 away from meeting our $25,000 budget. That's awesome. That's awesome, by the way. With the, with the Red Envelope Project, what, what that means is that it's, already, it's basically already done. We've basically already raised that money. We've got two more weeks of the Red Envelope Project. So we're actually going to keep gathering funds. You say, why are you going to keep gathering funds? If you were at our conference last summer, Pastor Troy Brewer was here. One of the things that Pastor Troy Brewer is doing is his ministry is actually, and this is totally illegal. They're, <laughs> yes, they're, they go, <laughs> they go into these countries where there is sex trafficking and they buy trafficked girls. 
they rescue them out of the sex trafficking industry they've they've also got um, lawyers and a legal team and they and 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 they, and they actually um, uh, press charges against these kidnappers and so it, it's incredible what they're doing they're not just raising awareness but they're actually going in um, when pastor Troy and his wife first went and they saw what was happening with these girls that were being kidnapped and they actually got to see how cheap you could buy a girl it so broke his heart that he came back and he and his wife refinanced their home take a, took a whole bunch of money out of their home so that they could go back and start buying girls they'd buy these girls they'd pay off their past debts and then they'd get them into restoration homes they'd pay for their education and then they'd pay for the prosecution of the men who kidnapped them and had them in slavery pastor troy brewer refinanced his home seven times just to rescue these girls this last week i was having a conversation with him and i thought man we got to do that and i said to pastor troy i said um i don't know if i'm ever going to get a chance to go myself and to buy to rescue one of these girls I don't know if I can do I, I know I can't do that right now but I know I can release my funds to rescue a girl the cost is three thousand dollars to rescue a girl to get her in housing to pay for her education and to provide funds for the prosecution of the men that kidnapped them we have no goal we're not saying we're gonna do three we're gonna save three girls or six girls we're just going to continue to raise funds over uh, next week and then the first week of January. And whatever comes in, we're going to send it. I had a conversation with Andrea last night. I said, you know, say, I would like to go. I would like to go and actually rescue, rescue one of these girls. I said, that'd be, I, that'd be so dangerous. It's dangerous. It's illegal. You've got the government. You've got the church. There's so much corruption that even religious institutions are a part of what's happening with these, with these girls. And um, I said, it'd be so dangerous, it'd be so crazy. Andrew goes, well, you went into CHOP. I was like, yeah, that's different. Wouldn't that be amazing to go and to actually rescue these, these, some of them are very, very young. And not just girls, there's little boys that are also being uh, kidnapped and even some of them, they're sold by their parents because their parents need money, so they're sold into uh, the sex trafficking thing. Today we're saying, enough is enough. Jesus is victorious in the life of every kidnapped girl. Jesus is victorious in the life of every kidnapped little boy. I pray that for the businessmen and businesswomen here, that you would get so ridiculously blessed so that we can funnel insane resources into the nations so we can shut this trash down. Get it. Listen. Get a dream. Get a dream from the Lord. For right now, we'll give into this. But SRC, we're going to, ah, uh, we're going to do some stuff. We're going to do some stuff in Seattle. How many of you guys watched that documentary that just came out about Seattle? What's the name of it? What is it? Fight for the Soul of Seattle. If you haven't watched that yet, Fight for the Soul of Seattle. You can YouTube it. Watch that. Why? Because that's an invitation to the church to fight for the soul of Seattle. Somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to do something. And our good ideas aren't going aren't to do it. There are God ideas. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of time. There's going to be a lot of reproach. There's going to be a lot of persecution around it. There's going to be a lot of Christian people that are going to want to crucify you. Because that's what religious people do. They're always trying to kill the Christ. That's what this is all about. I don't want a revival if it's just going to mean more church meetings. I want a revival because it's going to mean the transformation of cities and nations. And that's what I'm committed to. I know that that's what you're committed to. And my prayer is that through my influence, my prayer is that through your influence, my prayer is that through my platform, my prayer is that through your platforms, that we would partner together to say, no more compromise, no more shadiness, no more shiciness, no more partnering with the demonic realm, no more partnering with the kingdom of darkness. The line is being drawn in the stand, and we will take a stand, and through our generation, we're going to see the teeth of our enemies 